Hey, welcome back. I'm coming to you from my print studio again uh, here in the ugliest room in the ugliest house in my hometown, Vincennes, Indiana. And that sound means that uh, we just hot off the press got the first print from a series of printed images that I'm going to review. So if this is your first time here, welcome. Over the last 11 episodes, I've been um, uh, using the photographic process to explore the American heartland over the past winter, the pandemic winter. 2020 to 2021 and this is the last episode in what I intended to be a 12-part series so today I'm going to complete the process that we've gone through for some of these images making them on scene and processing them on the computer by printing out some of my favorite selections and reviewing the stories behind making them we've got the first one here so let's get it up under the loop and have a look Yeah, this upstairs downstairs print arrangement can be a pain but uh, usually when I do prints I try to do them in big batches and that's a little more efficient sometimes that process requires every square foot of space in my house but today I've pared it down to just this modest one table in my living room all right let's have a look at this print and see oh no looks like I've already got something lined up in the print queue to be framed and it's this ornery print from Adam Gibbs. Well, maybe I'm more excited about it than you are, but I can't wait to see what's in this package. I promise after we get a look at this, we will review all my favorite images from the series. Uh, I'll give you a little preview into my printing and framing and presentation process for those four of you that are interested in that. And then I'll give you three tips for selling your landscape photography prints, one of which I know you'll only hear from me. Let's rip it. It looks fantastic. I think later I'll make a video expressing my thoughts about this photo, but I'm very excited to have it. Uh, we'll get it in a frame with all the other prints that we're gonna make today. And I've got a special place earmarked for it next to my prized uh, Richard Brodigan broadside in my living room. Let's get to my print. This image is titled Elements. So this was one of the last photos I made before um, everything shut down for the pandemic. And I, I decided that for my Opt Outside Friday, I would return to this scene as part of a larger backpacking trip into the Hoosier National Forest. And even though I didn't intend to begin recording the series until December, I thought that if I brought my camera along, uh, maybe I could get some practice and potentially come out with an early start release to the uh, video series. And I actually came away with two videos from this trip, which uh, significantly put my video project ahead of schedule. So um, let's have a look at the experience that I had on Opt Outside Friday, hiking through the Hoosier National Forest to the location where I made elements. Keep exploring but I don't think I'm gonna find a better place to wind down my night than out there among those cedars doesn't that look so inviting so I will keep exploring but I've got a feeling that my evening winds up right out there with those beautiful old trees hot coffee and take a saunter out with the camera leave the campsite set up come back later wash up change clothes and head out for the day The extra work distance puts more mist between the camera and the subject. My memory card filled and my battery is also about to die. I, I photographed this location in an image that I called Elements. And I'll post that on the screen and if you're interested in it, maybe I'll also uh, relist it so you can purchase uh, some of the additions that are remaining from that sale. But for now, I'm just going to sit here on this rock and have a little moment before I head back. I'm um, very excited to finally get this image on paper, which is an ambition I've had for uh, almost a year now. And 
uh, that foray into the Hoosier National Forest, uh, I think was a great way to kick off this series. Um, one of the main themes of which is uh, that you know, wherever you live, uh, there are these little areas that you can find that, that will be special to you that you'll enjoy making photographs of. So that was fun. Let's print something else. So between the uh, two episodes of the Opt Outside uh, adventure, I decided that I wanted to do something to bring uh, entry-level photographers more into the fold with the video series. So I thought I had the idea of doing a more uh, tutorial-oriented uh, three-part series where we would spend one day on location making like a really basic landscape photo that you could take anywhere and sort of talk about camera operation and some more technical stuff like that. And then we would have a video where we would just edit the photo on our phone, which we did. Photo. Uh, stay tuned to the channel. You'll watch me take the image from the process of the capture we made together today uh, through that interpretive uh, digital process on the computer and maybe beyond. And, and then uh, now, I'm printing this photo that we made off from my phone on this uh, very entry-level photo printer, which is a uh, Canon MG6820 printer. Uh, so this is like one of those Black Friday special photo printers, four ink printer that you, you buy for less than the cost of the ink. Um, and that's, I don't remember what I paid for this, but it was less than $50. So most uh, entry-level photographers should find this within their budget. Um, and I'm printing off on a uh, favorite photo paper of mine that's not too expensive. This is Epson Metallic Photo, uh, Metallic Photo Paper Luster, which you can get at Office Max or, you know, probably an office supply store in your hometown. So not a elite hard to get paper. And uh, the print's coming out of the printer right now, so uh, once I get it out, we'll have a look at it and see how it turned out for us. Perfect. So we'll get this back downstairs with the rest to uh, dry, get a signature on it, get it framed up. But I just wanted to see, wanted to show you this uh, more basic photo printer. This is what I started out with before I got the Pro 10. Maybe in this video, I'll tell you the story of how I came to acquire the uh, Pro 10 A3 printer because that's uh, something I don't necessarily deserve, but it's an interesting story how I got it. And speaking of starting out, let me give you my first tip on selling a print like this. My first tip is that uh, the first sale avenue that I would recommend to you is in-person sales. People are so much more likely to buy from you if you can tell them the story, if they can meet you, um, you know, if they can physically see and hold uh, the product and you know verify its quality and, and exactly how it's gonna look instead of guessing through like online. So definitely take these things, you know, once you have an inventory of things like this, take them into your local gallery, um, you take them to some art shows. Uh, don't be alarmed if you get rejected, uh, if you don't get, uh, if you don't secure a position for yourself uh, in a gallery or a show right off the bat. Don't be afraid to go for it. You'll probably get some good feedback. And if you do find yourself in that situation, then my next two tips will be really helpful for you. Okay, this next one is a twofer. Uh, next in the series, we made a stop at Indiana Dunes National Park. So I got myself into a bit of a situation when I visited Indiana Dunes, uh, when I found myself nearing the very end of the day on a trail that was clearly much longer than a mile. I found that I was very far from my camera equipment. Take a look. Somehow I give myself a whole day to find a nice place to take a sunset photo and gotten myself into this predicament instead. I think I've got a problem. This trail might have been a little longer than I thought. I started out here, and now I'm here. Between that and the promise I made earlier that I'd follow this trail all the way to the end, I feel very challenged. I've got to get there. And I'm trying to get somewhere on this beach before sunset to take a picture. But first I have to get to my camera equipment out of my car, which is... Yeah. Come on! I'll position my camera to capture probably the shape of the di divide between the snow and the bare sand. So despite that big hiccup, uh, I still managed to come away with these two awesome images and actually several more. I had a lot of difficulty deciding which ones I wanted to print. So uh, this image is called In Dunes, as in Indiana Dunes. Um, uh, I, I've got a lot to say about this one, but I won't go into too much detail about it. Uh, you can watch the video if you want to see how I composed it. Um, 
uh, and later in my thought life, it's taken on a lot more significance to me, uh, particularly at this time of the year. And then this was just one of those scenes that you love to encounter basically by uh, pure happenstance as a photographer. Um, here we're looking at a scene uh, as the uh, crescent moon uh, rose up over uh, the scene as I was exploring down in the dunes. Uh, a great opportunity to frame up these tall uh, browned grasses in the winter. Um, features some of the uh, the uh, shape of the landscape and adorned with this um, perfect crescent moon right over the center. After everything wrapped up at the dunes, I also recorded this wildlife video. I didn't come away with any uh, print quality images from making that video, uh, but I think it's important to say that that's uh, typical from a day of wildlife shooting. Uh, but I had a great experience uh, tracking sandhill cranes across the state as they migrated south at the end of the winter. And I used my back catalog for uh, some to make some demonstrative points about wildlife photography. So I think we came away with a pretty good video. Uh, these are some clips from Hoosier Safari. So I'm gonna make my way back to the observation deck. I think that'd be a good place to get my bearings. Your viewer won't just identify the presence of an animal, but will be in conversation with it. So you want to make sure it's an interesting conversation. You should try birds. Birds. I'm telling you, you can't beat them. And then finally this winter we got some actual snow, an opportunity that I was able to capture over a couple of days making snow and frost photos in Illinois. When the frost first came, I jumped over to the countryside in Illinois, a location and a type of scene very familiar to me. Uh, check it out. Strong hoarfrost like this one when fog comes through and the fog freezes to the plants. It's interesting, it's lively, as you can hear the geese love it, and of course it's really beautiful. After that light frost, a huge fog system rolled in upstate in Illinois, and I chased that fog system to discover a beautiful hoarfrost in a forest and nature preserve, and got these two beautiful images from that experience. things to uh, see and shoot here so I'll be more spoiled for choice than starved for scenery. I literally stopped here because it smells really good. So I'm gonna stop here and take some smells and maybe excuse me some pictures. And then I realized that as I framed it more and more horizontally, there were just more and more tree branches that overlapped. I had a very difficult time deciding between which of these two images that I wanted to print. And I chose this one, which is called Chandelier and is available on my website in limited edition. But as soon as I, as soon as I went to print this, I actually uh, got an, or an order for it. So this one is spoken for. It's on its way out the door to Maryland, uh, which gave me the opportunity to print this one and see how it turned out for me. I think they both look great. This will give me an opportunity to talk about my second tip when it comes to selling your landscape photo prints. So as I mentioned, I did sell this print through my website. Um, 
I highly recommend having a website to sell your prints. It's going to give people the opportunity to connect with you uh, that may not be able to attend a regular in-person event. So like I said, I sold this image online. Uh, what I didn't say that the customer, Roz, is actually an old friend of mine. In fact, I could probably count on one hand the number of times a complete stranger has discovered me through my website and purchased a print from me sight unseen. So yeah, it's good to have a way for your past acquaintances to connect with you um, and maybe rediscover you through your photography, but you'll be much more successful selling to people who have at least seen you or the quality of your product, preferably both. Uh, so if you're really dedicated to making sales online, how can you give people the impression of familiarity uh, with you and the quality of your product. Um, why do you think I'm making this video? So to conclude the series, I decided that I would give myself a double challenge of finding a uh, rural photo spot that was appropriate to make a video, um, but also making the photo with a really old camera. So uh, let's see how I did uh, handling those challenges. And before I show you this awesome barn shot that I've got set up is we need to talk about what rural exploration or Rurex photography is. And I wanted to share with you some of the obstacles and hurdles that I've had to jump over to get to the point of making this video this evening. Where I can sort of pull off and make a video for you and not be bothered. And this is the barn that I came to shoot. <laughs> it is gone. The barn's been replaced by this bulldozer. Well, so far it's been terrible luck finding a place to make a, a, a Rurex video. So uh, hopefully today I find a spot because it's the last day that I have to make this video. Unbelievable! I have an idea. I had a stroke of pure, utter genius. Maybe I could borrow your camera? Hey, my memory serves me right. Didn't you make a video about using a backup camera one point in time? Backup camera backup camera to have just in case your camera fails on the job. That doesn't sound familiar. You use your old backup camera, I'll use mine, and uh, we'll see what we can do. Fine! I forgot how much I missed and loved composing through an optical viewfinder. So I'll show the final image here, but I'll also show you what that loser, Garrett Gillette, came up with. And uh, I'd like to see him compete with this, huh? Outstanding. But before we move too much further, I just wanted to look at these two photos side by side because th these are like the demonstration photos for what can really be achieved for entry level photographers nowadays who want to get into printing. Uh, this one we made totally edited with a smartphone and printed from a smartphone on an entry level printer and it looks fantastic. And this one we uh, also made the photograph with a 10 year old used camera. And after I made this video, I was able to give away the camera. So I want to thank the uh, 35-ish people who participated in the giveaway on YouTube, as well as congratulate the winner, Azariah of Texas. Uh, he emailed me to confirm that he received the camera and he's putting it to good use. So thanks to everyone who uh, who chipped in and make that a uh, successful uh, successful event. Okay, if you stayed tuned through all of that, thank you so much. I know that for some of you that was a bit redundant and you've been tagging along and watching these videos for a long time. I can't stay in this house much longer. Let's get these images in a frame and then I promise you we will get out and I'll give you my third top tip for selling your landscape photos.
Okay, it's been a few days since we were here at the table, so a few things have changed. Hope that wasn't too jarring for you, but I stocked up on the frames and other art supplies that I'll need to complete the project. Um, I turned the camera around because I was tired of looking at my jackets, and I mowed like 3,000 yards, so my allergies are kind of going crazy. If it wasn't obvious from the appearance, it's definitely obvious from the way I feel that spring is in the air. Okay, we got the barn scene in front of us. This was the um, that last image that we made in the series, sort of the culminating image, and so I'm going to start with this. I'm going to show how I would package this for uh, to make a really basic uh, art product out of it. So this is going to entail um, putting my stamp on it, signing it, and then I've got this um, really basic uh, document mat from the Hobby Lobby. Um, these are pretty great because they're automatically cut to fit a document and if we do a full bleed eight and a half by 11 inch print like this, um, it's exactly the right size. Um, normally I buy these in bulk from a reseller on Amazon. I think they're called Golden State Art Supplies. Um, all right, let's get cracking on it. I don't always have great experiences with Hobby Lobby. I ordered this from Office Max. They can make a stamp basically that looks like anything you want. Um, I also take my used ink cartridges to Office Max, so this sort of paid for itself with store credit. And give it a stamp -a So generally when I put an image out for sale, I think it looks better with a signature on it and I'll put a signature on it. And I find that that's what most customers want. And we'll, we'll let this ink dry so it doesn't smudge or smear. Ooh, how's that sound? When a, t a potential customer sees your photo in this, They'll imagine it in a frame. They'll imagine owning it. It is uh, double matted, so there's a uh, um, uh, an inner and an outer mat, so that looks very nice. The backing is really flimsy, so yeah, Hobby Lobby. I'll just um, apply a little pressure to get those butted up even and make sure that there's the uh, gap on either side is about even and then I'll just, I, I find that masking tape's a really good material for this purpose. Now this mat will hinge open and shut like this, see. About like that. And then I'll hold the print in place with this fancy thing, which is a sock full of coins. I'll mount the print using this. Uh, this is, uh, I think Linco is the brand. It's a um, linen mounting tape and the, the adhesive is a, an acid-free archival adhesive. So I'll cut out four strips. So what we're gonna do is make a, a T-shaped hinge. So if I take the backing slip, this is how I do it. And I'll lift a corner of the print and I'll put the, apply the, um, and I like to get these pretty close to the print. Sorry if you can hear the birds outside. They're not happy with me. I had to relocate their nest off my porch yesterday, so there's a bit of a, a bird fracas out there. Okay, now we've got it in the mat. I'll go ahead and put my signature on it. Uh, I print these on, so uh, if you buy uh, Canon ink from Canon, they'll usually give you a little extra thing, some kind of bonus for buying their ink. And on the small ink printers, that's usually a uh, like a 50 pack of four by six photo paper. So I use that to make little things like this, greeting cards, mailers, invoices, packing slips, stuff like that. And then we'll just put that right in the middle and a piece of, Double-sided tape makes that a nice, neat presentation. And once the signature dries, um, we'll get this in the cellophane sleeve and it'll look like something you might want to buy. So Hobby Lobby doesn't have barcode scanning technology, so they put these uh, awesome price tag, like yard sale price tags on everything in the store that you have to peel off and they leave a nice uh, adhesive residue. It's really wonderful. Really great job, guys. And these materials were terrible to work with. Okay, I've got this exact same kit for the um, Sunset Creek picture from Kentucky. And then I'm gonna take that one one step further and get it into a frame. So I've got this frame selected. It was a cheap frame, $10. 
So between this and, and the mat and the print, we've got about $20 in the whole product. You know, let, let's get it framed up and see if we can sell it. Okay, we've got our finished print here. Uh, looks great in the frame. The frame's a really good match for it. Just a simple black frame. It's what a lot of galleries are wanna see. I've got one little mark, scuff mark here on the side that I'll have to fix. Um, so I'll fix that with uh, a Sharpie. couple notes on this framing job. Uh, so first off, the wire hanger that I used, I didn't realize I'm out of my good wire hanger. Um, so normally I use a, 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 I think you can see the difference there. I'll have to run out and get some wire for um, the bigger frames I'm gonna be doing. And then you can see, I also normally put a, uh, a little bit of a, uh, heat shrink wrap on the end there too. So uh, just to cover up the, the rough edge from folding the wire back over. So aside from that, the bigger framing jobs that I'm gonna do are basically gonna match this one. It's copy, paste, and repeat. So we won't go through every one just like that, uh, but I am gonna go do a whole bunch of framing right now and I'll catch up with you after that project. Somehow I got this far into this topic without mentioning cutting mats. I cut my own mats uh, primarily for convenience so I don't have to wait on a store to do it. So one of the objectives I had for this video series was to sort of recap and reflect on this very noteworthy and peculiar winter. And, uh, you know, over the course of the series, like and in life, I haven't really dwelt on the pandemic or like how it's affected me. When I started recording the series, I was a student and I was working in a tool store, as you saw in that first video. Um, and it was like the winter holiday season and I had a lot of leisure time. Now, I was supposed to be taking this semester abroad, which is not even remotely possible. So I have taken the semester off 
and I've had to jump into this factory and I have like no leisure time. So I have to actually go work a shift at the factory real quick. So when I get off, we'll run these photos around and, um, and I'll tell you also how I ruined the end of this video. daylight when you get into work and it's daylight when you get off and you got no time to go look at the sunrises and sunsets. All right. Let's talk. I think normally the uh, undertaking I'm about to embark on is something that uh, I would like utterly dread. <laughs> So one way that I definitely noticed that coming out of this pandemic has sort of left me in a different state is that I'm absolutely looking forward to getting out and talking to strangers. <laughs> Look out, strangers! So I gotta kill. That's better. It's gonna be very hot. I gotta confess how I ruined the conclusion to this video, the capstone to this entire 12 part series. The concept of the uh, video conclusion was basically this. I take all the uh, prints from these images that we've uh, gone around, you know, flyover country, making over the winter, um, and I take them to areas that are like uh, local to the areas where the photo was taken. I bring them into local businesses. I swindle the business owners into letting me display them there for sale. Shot one, walking into business, print under arm. Shot two, walking out empty handed, big thumbs up at the camera. Shot after shot after shot, fireworks, roll credits, series over. Now you're thinking, uh, Matt, but you know, it doesn't seem very likely that these complete strangers are going to let you hang their pictures in their businesses. So there were a couple things working against this, uh, probably going off successfully. That's no problem. I had a backup plan. We go over the reasons that this, uh, venture was unsuccessful and, uh, talk about, you know, good ways to recover from it and how it's like a good exercise in getting your feet wet and meeting people. Somehow I messed that up. Two, here's what happened. And I set about trying to deliver these prints to some retailers. And to my surprise, I had luck placing a couple of them. And so I thought, oh no, maybe I'm actually gonna make this work out. I spent the next two weeks relentlessly chasing leads, trying to place the rest of them. And well, here we are. I've still got all these prints in the back. So somehow I managed to neither succeed nor fail in this endeavor. So I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and debrief this as if it were a complete failure so I can talk about ways that I think I can, you know, learn from this and recover as a way of wrapping up the discussion we've been having about techniques that I've used in my enterprise of selling photo prints. I had to pull off on the side of the interstate, which is highly illegal, but you've got to hear this. Tell me you can hear this. That's the Brood X cicadas. They're louder than the traffic on the interstate. So I'll go ahead and recap the three points that I was trying to make about selling prints because I'm not sure exactly how eloquently I stated this uh, <laughs> two weeks ago when I uh, originally started this discussion. Also, I've noticed that like when I have these discussions, like I tend to be really like you, you, you as if like I'm some expert instructing you, but uh, really I just intend for these to be like me, you know, sharing my experiences and, and, and telling you what's worked for me and hasn't worked for me uh, so that maybe, you know, this is something you can learn from. But I will say you to start this out in just this one instance. Uh, a lot of the advice you're gonna hear about selling prints is going to be to uh, dissuade you from trying to sell prints. And I think that's because uh, people who give this advice, you know, amateurs like me, we're afraid that you're gonna go out and like try to quit your job and live off selling photo prints, um, right? When obviously this is not a, it, of all the things you might do 
you know, with your photography, this is maybe the least lucrative thing that you could do. Um, but I have consistently over the last few years made a few thousand dollars a year selling photo prints. So I don't really want to discourage you from making it one of maybe several streams of photography income that you might pursue. And not necessarily to sound like I'm bragging, but I, I am proud that, you know, the prints that I make uh, are a uh, sustainable, you know, not full on income, but uh, they, they're profitable. Uh, they support the pur purchases of my camera gear. And I don't think that's because my prints are uh, better than the next photographers. Like I just, I think that it's the result of uh, a lot of hard work that I've put in behind the wheel, behind the lens, behind the computer monitor, behind the scenes. But obviously uh, this wouldn't support me as a, as a, as a sole means of income. Um, so here are three things that I've learned from the past three years of selling my photo prints. First, uh, if there's one conclusion that I'm very confident in drawing, I will far and away drastically make uh, a higher number of sales to people that I encounter in person and who can actually see and experience the product I'm selling, right? So uh, in this regard, uh, selling photo prints is a lot like any other type of salesmanship. Um, so that's why my first recommendation is that you get into a gallery or an art show where you can uh, mingle with people and you know make an in-person argument uh, for your work. In fact, if I thought that that were a viable solution for everyone, that would be the only solution I would offer. It's it's that dramatic of a drop off between this method and the next method of making sales. Um, however, you know it's not guaranteed you'll get a placement in a gallery. Uh, a lot of galleries are not even interested in accepting photography, um, or, or especially not um, like very you know facially literal uh, photography like landscape photography. Um, and you know there is sort of a price barrier for entry in art shows. I think I probably did two shows before I broke even again on that investment. So I understand that uh, not every photographer will necessarily uh, have access to an in-person sales venue. So I think the next best thing is um, if a customer can't meet with you in person, if they can at least see your product in person. Oh, this road is so bumpy. I'm trying to make these recordings in like the brief smooth patches. Yeah, this footage is gonna suck. So that brings me to what I think would be the second best option. Uh, which is the endeavor we're about today, uh, trying to get these prints into a non-art space. Um, and I'm particularly thinking of places where people uh, spend a lot of time and will be interacting with the, the artwork for a prolonged period of time, like a hair salon or a restaurant. Uh, so the idea here is um, I've made these cards, speaking of things to use uh, extra four by six photo paper for, with these QR codes on them, and I just attach this little placard to the print, and a customer at the business um, can buy it in a process that's uh, sort of transparent to the uh, to the space owner and doesn't really require their involvement. And then I offer a commission to them if the piece sells. Normally, if I do this, I would also let the space owner select the piece, which is like really a great incentive. Uh, then they can sort of basically decorate their space with my artwork for free and um, and also make a commission on it if it sells. So uh, normally this is a, a pretty strong argument that I find, but there are a couple snags that I've hit in, in this particular instance um, that are sort of like unique to these circumstances. One, I'm working away from my home area. The problem with that is that the people in those areas don't know me at all. I don't have a working relationship with them. They don't follow me on social media, but they do now. Right, so my hope is that if I should return, um, there will be some familiarity there. Uh, the other big hurdle is something that I do occasionally run into and that, that I, I do feel confident in advising you in, and that is that um, it can be very hard to sell work that is, um, that is overtly seasonal, okay, um, uh, out of season. So these images that I've been trying to get rid of are necessarily seasonal because they're from this winter 
um, you know, Heartland photo series. So, right, they're snowy as heck. They're bare tree limbs. Like, they're uh, overtly seasonal images that are not germane here at the end of spring um, in the first week of June. So take uh, autumn, for example, right? Um, as soon as the weather starts getting cool, like in October, um, there are all these fall-themed art shows, autumn art fairs. Uh, people are feeling, you know, um, sentimental or romantic about the change of the seasons, and they're out shopping for, you know, fall decor and, and fall-themed art products. That's like a month before the leaves change, and I can be out making fall photos. The same thing happens in the winter. People are out, like, you know, in the weeks leading up to Christmas looking for winter stuff, even though, you know, it's typical we don't get snow until, like, February or like this year we got one of our biggest snows in March so uh, so another way that having the this uh, really seasonal inventory is not a loss is that this year when winter comes around I'll have these photos ready to go so in art spaces where I'm having to compete with uh, say painters who can you know paint seasonal images you know on demand and I've got an inventory to compete with that now so uh, I think that'll be a plus this year as well. So we maybe didn't have a win from this exercise today, but I do think that with the extra familiarity that I've built with these uh, store owners um, and the advance that I've got um, on the seasons, maybe this can be a success story for this winter. So a third option, if those previous two venues, you know, uh, weren't, weren't available to me for whatever reason, but an option that I would keep open regardless uh, is online sales. And of course, with all these strategies, don't forget to use your own creativity. That's a big part of the fun. Just like your photography, apply yourself to it and do it your own way. So today after these weeks of failure, I have returned to the town of Bird's Eye, Indiana. It's my last stop, my last chance to drop off a print somewhere hoping for luck so we can close this out with something of a success story. Normally, inspirational music has done the trick. Cue some inspirational music. of those cicadas at all, I'll be amazed. Well, I struck out on that one too, but you can't win them all. In my case, uh, you can't win many. Uh, but I'll tell you what I did win was some great photo opportunities uh, exploring the Midwest through photography. I hope you enjoyed uh, this exploratory series as much as I did. Uh, while I was here at Bird's Eye, I thought I'd stop off at the trailhead and see how the scenery has changed. This is where I started the series. This is where I'm going to end it. It's definitely summer, and we're out of this terrible winter. I'm looking forward to getting back to making some like regular, good old, simple photography vlogs. So until that next video, you keep an eye out and a foot forward, and thanks for watching. Uh, you know... And this has been a crazy, this particular, and this has been a particularly crazy winter with the uh, pandemic. It's been a particularly crazy winter. Today I'll hike around and just, um, today I'll hike around, I'll, I'll enjoy myself and, and um, I think today I'll just hike around and. Hike on? Yep. Just got a box on my face. No box. What was I saying? Oh yeah. probably passed on a hundred. Uh, uh, I say if I, uh, so the, the alignment of all the